Cora TV. The world is thinking. Good morning. Uh, my name's um, Bruno Waterfield. I'm the Brussels correspondent um, for the Daily Telegraph. Um, and um, I'm going to be um, chairing and moderating this session this morning, um, looking at Israel after 60 years and asking um, what happened um, to the Zionist um, dream. What I'd quite like us to do in, in, in terms of the discussion and, and how we um, approach it is to be quite um, reflective, um, to, to look at Israel and to look at um, Zionism in, in an objective um, but critical way, actually as if we were dissecting any other um, aspect of Western thought or any other um, development in terms of um, the state or the British state in terms of its internal dynamics um, and external um, relations. So that's the kind of um, the kind of frame or the mindset in which I think it would be good if we um, approached um, the debate. So we think about um, Israel in relation to its own founding principles into its um, undeniable um, energy um, in terms of building um, something completely new, perhaps the most modern of the Western states. I want us to think about um, the ideas um, of, of, of Zionism as disparate of all the different trends in Enlightenment um, thought um, and to think about some of the reactions um, against it. I want us to think about um, Israel um, and some of its um, troubled relations and compromises with foreign powers, particularly Britain and the United States. And I also want us to think about, and I'm sure we'll discuss, um, Israel's relations um, with its um, <coughs> Arab um, neighbours. And, and by doing that, I think we can start to really think about um, what Israel means today after 60 years and what it means um, to be um, Jewish um, and also to think about how it is that Zionism that was once a very modern, very exciting um, idea um, that came um, from the oppressed in terms of emancipation has now to come to be associated um, with um, oppression and the opposite of its original um, roots. I think we, we, we really think about um, some of those issues and really listen to some of the very, very good speakers um, we've got today, we can really start to come to terms with what um, Israel uh, means today and what it means <coughs> for the future. Um, I'm going to introduce um, the speakers um, in the order um, that they're going to speak. And I just want to very, very quickly um, say a couple of the kind of formal rules um, by which I'm going to chair today, because I'm one of these very old-fashioned um, chairs who, 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 who thinks there should be quite strict rules. First of all, um, this morning, we'll be hearing from um, Professor um, Asher Sussa, who is the Director of External Affairs of the Moshe Dayan Centre for Middle Eastern Studies um, in Tel Aviv, and he's the editor of Challenges to the Cohesion of the Arab State. After that, we'll be hearing from Carl. Um, Carl is um, an often trenchant commentator on Middle East um, politics and culture. And he's also a founder member and writer of a manifesto towards a new humanism in architecture. Then we'll be hearing from Abi Shlaim here, um, who is professor of international relations at the University of Oxford, um, a fellow of St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and author of The Iron Wall, Israel and the Arab World, and Lion um, of, of Jordan. And finally, we'll be hearing from Ned Temko, journalist and commentator at The Observer, former editor of the Jewish Chronicle, um, former chief Middle East correspondent for Christian Science Monist, uh, Monitor and author or, of To Win or Die. They're all going to speak for roughly between seven or nine minutes. I'm going to be quite tough with them in terms of that speaking time. We will then op uh, maybe take a few points between ourselves um, on the panel and then open it um, up to the floor. What I want to do is try and get as many points in. I want people to be if necessary, get the chance to make a couple of points. So I'm going to really be tough and limit contributions to the floor um, to 90 seconds. When I go like that, it's time to start shutting up. 
and when I say stop, it would be good if you could stop, and that will enable me to get as many points as possible in and to bring the panel to and fro um, in, in the discussion so that we can really get to grips with some of these issues and you have the chance to interrogate um, some of our um, panellists. So, let's begin. Um, Professor Asher Sussa. Well, uh, thank you very much, and uh, just uh, a word of thanks to the organisers for having uh, invited me to participate in this uh, very distinguished panel with such uh, distinguished speakers alongside uh, me here. Uh, in reference to the question uh, posed, uh, what has happened to the Zionist dream, I'd like to make in the seven or eight minutes that I have uh, five or six points that I will make very telegraphically. First of all, what is Zionism? Zionism is a term that has, I think, been uh, uh, distorted in the eyes of many for some decades now. I am a Zionist by the way I define myself, which means that I am a Jewish nationalist who believes in the right of the Jewish people to self-determination like other peoples. Has uh, Zionism achieved its historical objectives? If the objective was to create a state for the Jews and to allow the Jews to exercise their right to self-determination. This dream in most respects has been fulfilled. The anthem of Israel and the anthem of the Zionist movement spoke about being a free people in our country. Iliot am chofshi barteno, as we say. And we are a free people uh, in our country and that uh, achievement was made against the odds, uh, to put it mildly, in rather difficult circumstances. Obviously there have been and still are a host of problems inherent in the fulfillment of the Zionist enterprise. To discuss that, which I think very often uh, the media does not discuss, there are two contexts in which this Zionist enterprise has operated, which we should bear in mind. One cannot understand what drove the Jews to seek this fulfillment in a sovereign state of the Jewish people without understanding the European context of the Jewish predicament at the end of the 19th and the early 20th century, and then later on to the horrific results of the Second World War. It really still is very difficult to understand what makes the Jews tick unless one understands their desire on the basis of their recent past to achieve a dignified existence, to live as a collective in dignity in a state of their own. <clears throat> the other context that one has to bear in mind is that this Zionist pursuit has resulted in a horrendous tragic conflict between the Jews and their neighbors. And one cannot understand <clears throat> much of what Israel is today without bearing in mind that the whole project has been fulfilled in a state of almost incessant conflict. Having said all that, <clears throat> Just as in my opening remark I mentioned that the aspiration of the Jews was to be a free people in their own country, this will never really be fulfilled to its utmost until the Palestinians are a free people in their country too. What is really at the root of the tragedy here is the incapacity, or what has proved to be so far the incapacity, of these two legitimate national movements to express themselves simultaneously, one alongside the other, rather than in interminable conflict between themselves. And the rest I will leave for discussion. Well, that was admirably <laughs> brief. Um, Carl. Yeah. 
I hope I can be as brief. Uh, I too would like to start by uh, answering the question posed by the title of this session. And I would agree that uh, that dream has culminated, the Zionist dream has culminated in the foundation of the State of Israel, um, which is an independent and functioning state regardless of our opinions and uh, personal opinions about it and its legitimacy and towards its policy. Uh, it's an independent functioning state. However, there's something very specific about it. It's a state that doesn't have stable borders yet, and, and, and uh, it, these are open to interpretation, a point that I'll come back to later. That is the simple part of the answer to the question. The more complex part, uh, I think, is that by any objective measures, and I'm taking your uh, instruction very seriously, Bruno, uh, by any objective measure, Zionism today is over as a political project. Let's not kid ourselves. And although some people might find that contentious, I don't think that's the contentious part. What's more important is to discuss what the significance of this development is for Israel, Israeli politics, Israeli society, and the relationship between Israel and the Palestinians. Why do I make this claim? I'm certainly not the first one to make that claim. Both in Israel and outside of Israel, there are commentators that have talked about uh, post-Zionism, for example, a point that I will rely on to um, kind of to a certain extent to justify, justify the claim that Zionism as a political project is over. And on the other hand, if we look at the actions of, of uh, the Israeli political elites in the past few years, I think they're predominantly driven by uh, very mundane, pragmatic considerations that somehow betray the ideals of Zionism or even um, uh, kind of exhibit a lack of any comprehensive political project. I'll take these two points and develop them a little bit and then discuss the, uh, the significance of that transformation. Uh, let me start first by, um, if you like, this um, particular way in which Israeli foreign, not, let's not call it foreign policy, attitude towards the, the Palestinian problem in particular has been playing out in the last few years and take two things like the withdrawal from Gaza and the security wall in particular. And it seems to be, if you, if you kind of coll collect these uh, uh, decisions together and look at them, what seems to be emerging is a picture of politicians that are acting out of pure fear uh, of a um, potential Palestinian and Arab uh, demographic superiority within Israel and the occupied territories. And there's a last ditch attempt towards um, consolidating the territory of Israel um, before an anticipated uh, two-state solution, a de facto two-state solution, and not a negotiated one. And this, to my mind, particularly when you see what the withdrawal from Gaza uh, signifies, is a far cry from the ideological uh, kind of uh, um, tenets of Zionism and that how uh, shaped the policies of Israel in, in the past. Um, putting that to aside, uh, let's look at um, this kind of uh, notion that Israel today is going through its uh, post-Zionist phase, which is an idea that's been proposed a few years back, and there's been a lot of books written about it, and it's been discussed a lot, and it took a little bit of a setback well, after the Intifada, but it's still out there. Um, and the idea is that by uh, Israel is kind of transforming itself now to becoming a more democratic and pluralist society, and uh, there's a healthy critical engagement with the history of Zionism and, and, and how Zionism was founded on certain ideas. But I think the conclusions that what's happening now, the abandonment of these ideas, means that Israel will become this democratic uh, state are not necessarily correct. And if we examine the language that's used to describe this uh, concept of post-Zionism and why it would lead to a better uh, um, Israel, or a different Israel at least, they rely on concepts such as pluralism, multiculturalism, human rights, which are all imported from uh, contemporary Western sociopolitical parlance. But they, are not, they do not have any specific political context, or they're not embedded in a larger political project. They are used completely as abstract notions and uh, somehow reflect the wishful thinking of a particular class of leftists in Israel that they can reshape Israel by, by this uh, in engagement with these ideas. But these ideas in and of themselves could also be dangerous. If we talk the, take the notion of multiculturalism, for example, which is something the West is, is uh, I think, have experimented with, and, and the way it plays out in 
in Israel is not only seen as the way to orchestrate the relationship between Jews and Arabs within Israel, but it's also now a way to orchestrating relationship between one Jewish group and another. Uh, for example, the attitude towards uh, immigrants from Arab countries, Jewish immigrants from Arab countries, or immigrants from the former Soviet Union uh, is characteristic of that, where there's no longer the idea of a greater collective. It's more about uh, this uh, orchestration between uh, relationships between different cultural groups. Uh, and if you look, for example, what happened about a week ago in the negotiations between Levni and Shah's party, and both parties claimed that the, the negotiations failed because of these great ideals refusing to put Jerusalem on negotiation table and all of that, it was the far more mundane issue of child stipends. And it's really like a parody of uh, the culture wars that we see in America and other Western countries, whereby uh, if you like, politics becomes this real mundane issue of uh, uh, discussing budgets and policies and, and forgets completely any kind of grander vision. Um, so what I, what I tried to say is in both kind of uh, the, the, the behavior of the political elites in Israel, both in power and outside, there is a lack of any kind of uh, uh, conceptual framework or a political project today, and there's much more either pragmatic or, or a wishful desire for transforming things. Um, why is that problematic? Um, in two, uh, very quickly, on, on two levels. One, in terms of the relationship of Israel to its neighbors. We've seen in 2006 a catastrophic uh, confrontation between Israel and Hezbollah, which was catastrophic for both countries. And it was a, an illustration of when violence becomes an end of itself and is not backed, out, backed up by any specific political ideas or political project or political aims, as would have been characteristic of all Israel's wars in the past. Even the catastrophic invasion of Lebanon in 1982, Sharon had a clear idea of transforming the whole Middle East by this uh, uh, crazy idea, but it was driven by a very clear political idea. Today, because of the lack, lack of that political framework, Unfortunately, what happens is violence escalates out of any control, and nobody knows why it should stop or when can it stop, and this is quite detrimental. It's also detrimental within Israel itself uh, to the kind of the, the, the emergence of a new sense of politics that can take Israel into this next, next phase and restore a sense of justice to its relationships with the Palestinians. A lot of my fellow Arabs would like to say, think that these uh, divisions within Israel would lead to its downfall. I don't share that idea. The, but, but the concept that, yeah, thank you. But the concept that somehow we would replace a, a national sense of politics and a national political project with this fragmented uh, Western model of multiculturalism will only lead to a weakening of uh, uh, politics, a sense of politics in Israel. I would just like to close by saying that Zionism was never a homogenous project. There were different voices within Zionism from early on. Um, and I remember something that, or I read something that uh, Hannah Arendt said even before the foundation of uh, Israel. And she said, it's a folly to rely on a distant imperial power for protection and alienating all of our neighbors. And I think certainly the solution today, or the step forward not only for Israel, but all for the people of the region, is to realization that they have to live together in that area and it's better to rely on their good relationships with their neighbors rather than on the patronage of the West. And to stop asking for the intervention of the West and take matters on their own hands as in as much as Zionism provided an example historically of what taking matters into our own hands and shaping our destiny could be a successful thing. Thank you. Thank you. Abby. Is it possible Israelis celebrated the 60th birthday in a somber mood. A somber mood because despite the spectacular successes and achievements of the first 60 years, there was one outstanding failure, the failure to resolve peacefully the conflict with uh, the conflict with uh, um, uh, Arab neighbors. In my introductory remarks, I'm going to concentrate on only one aspect of Israeli society in 60, and that is Israel's relations with the Arabs and especially with the Palestinians. My position is clear and unambiguous. I have never questioned the legitimacy of the state of Israel within its pre-1967 borders. What I reject 
and reject uncompromisingly is the Zionist colonial project beyond the green line. The primary goal of Zionism was to establish an independent Jewish state in Palestine. This goal was achieved in 1948, and by 1967, there was a strong, viable Jewish state in the Middle East. The Zionist dream had been realized. The June 1967 war changed everything. It derailed the course of Zionist history. It reopened the question of the territorial aims of Zionism. And secondly, for the first time, Israel was able to offer its neighbors something in return for peace, territory. And all international peace plans since 1967 have been based, or most of them, have been based on UN Resolution 242 and the principle that it encapsulated of land for peace. <coughs> but after the spectacular military victory, uh, Israelis became more interested in land than they were in peace, especially on the Eastern Front. Religious messianism combined with secular nationalism to produce the greater Israel movement, Gush Emunim, and the settlements in the occupied territories. Let us be clear about this. The settlements, all of them, are illegal and they are the main obstacle to peace. Zionism had always been both about values, universal values, and territory. After 1967, the Israelis developed an obsession with territory. Territory, the territorial imperative, became the overriding uh, goal. When Israel was able to overcome this territorial obsession, it achieved peace with Egypt in, 1960, in 1979 in return for returning the whole of Sinai. And again, in 1994, it achieved a peace, peace treaty with Jordan in return for, uh, ret uh, in return for restoring to Jordan its territory. Israel can have peace with Syria, but there is a price tag, and the price tag is complete Israeli withdrawals in Syria to the borders on the 4th of June, 1967. The West Bank is more difficult than the other occupied territories for an obvious reason, and that is that the Zionist dream have all, has always been more intimately connected with the West Bank, with Judea and Samaria, with um, the biblical homeland. There are two nations and one land, hence the conflict. The Palestinian problem has always been and remains the core of the Arab-Israeli conflict. And there will be no peace and no stability in the Middle East until this problem is solved. Yet, Israelis, whatever their political hue, have always had a blind spot when it came to the Palestinians Palestinian question. In 1993, Yitzhak Rabin took the plunge. Um, he signed um, the Oslo Accord with the PLO, and he, clean, he clinched the historic compromise with a very hesitant handshake with uh, Yasser Arafat in the White House. But Rabin was assassinated, and the peace process was derailed. Um, the Oslo pro peace process broke down. Why did it break down? The critics say it was doomed to failure from the start. I say the, P the Oslo peace process broke down because Israel, under the leadership of the Likud, reneged on its part of the bargain. And if you want me to be more precise, I can be. I can summarize uh, the main reason for the breakdown of this process in one word, settlements. Um, you cannot go forward on the political front towards a settlement with the Palestinians and at the same time be stealing more and more of their land. Land grabbing and peacemaking simply don't go hand in hand together. Uh, Ariel Sharon was in power for five years during which there were no negotiations on final status with the Palestinian Authority. He was the champion of violent solutions 
a Jewish Rambo. His aim, in a word, was po politicide, to deny the Palestinians any independent Palestinian existence in Palestine. He was the unilateralist par excellence, excuse my French. He wanted to redraw unilaterally the borders of greater Israel. Um, building the wall was part of this um, uh, unilateral approach. The withdrawal from Gaza was also part of this um, unilateralist approach. Ehud Olmert followed in the footsteps of Ariel Sharon. His policy, as Carl just pointed out, has been a mani manifest failure. It brought Israeli society to a dead end. Today, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Worse than that, it turned Israel into an apartheid state. And because Israel has become an apartheid state, it has lost very steadily international sympathy and support. And I very much agree with Hannah Arendt on this front, on this um, issue. So the key problem today is the occupation. Even Ehud Olmert now recognizes this after three years in power. Last month, he gave a very important interview to Yediot Aharonot, in which he said, we are kidding him ourselves if, if we think that we can achieve peace with the Palestinians without withdrawal from all or almost all of the occupied territories. And the territories that we keep, we have to compensate them in a ratio of one to one from our own Israeli state land. Olmert is the embodiment of the right-wing Zionist dream. So if he says the occupation must end and we must return all the territories, the moment of truth has really arrived. I differ from Ehud Olmert in one respect. Um, I think that Israel should return all the occupied territories to the Palestinians, not as a concession, not as a favor to the Palestinians, but as a favor to itself. Because as Karl Marx, not this Karl, but Karl Marx <laughs> pointed out, uh, a people that oppresses another cannot itself remain free. So to conclude, what has happened to the Zionist dream? My answer is that the Zionist dream has been destroyed by relentless Israeli land grabbing and by Israel's reliance on military force. And yet, I don't want to end on a pessimistic note. In the long term, I'm not pessimistic, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because I believe that nations like individuals are capable of acting rationally after they have exhausted all the other alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> there, you've got plenty of uh, material yeah. to work with there, I think. Can we move yes. back again? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm seizing territory there, Avi. It's, uh, <laughs> it's unintentional. Um, I'm in the happy position of speaking last and um, broadly agreeing with a lot of the points made by all three of the other speakers. And I, I, I think the one thing I would disagree with is our, uh, our chairman's uh, suggestion that we can discuss this topic uh, like any other kind of intellectual delving into European political thought. Uh, there's, a, there's a Hebrew phrase, alavai, you know, if only, or yaret, as we would say in Arabic. Um, uh, one of my long-time experiences covering the region and then editing um, the Jewish Chronicle um, and indeed covering the region for a broadly pro-Arab paper, the Christian Science Monitor. I'm running out of religions having worked for the Christian Science Monitor, the Jewish Chronicle. Um, I'm hoping the Muslim age will hire me uh, next week. Uh, but one of the things I have, I have discovered is this is a potentially toxic issue, and it is an issue which is al almost defeats the ability um, to discuss objectively and rationally. And I think the reason begins with Asher's first comment, and that is, what is Zionism? 
and it was picked up in various ways by Karl and then by Avi, and that is that Zionism um, as, a, as a defining principle uh, a- almost has lost uh, its value uh, a- as a subject for discussion because it has changed so dramatically over the last six decades. But more than that, and this is a point I'll come back to in a few moments, because one of the great weaknesses of Zionism, along with its many other strengths, uh, was its failure to define uh, some of its core principles at the beginning. And Carl explained partly why that was. Zionism uh, was a a nationalist movement that had many strains. uh, And it had many strains both in terms of simple politics, that is, you know, r- ranging from Jabotinsky on the right wing uh, to other thinkers on the far left. Uh, it had a huge divide uh, on religious grounds. I mean, one of the great ironies of, of this topic, I mean, we're in a largely secular left wing kind of audience here, but when I was asked to join this panel, uh, I said, of course, I'd love to. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not, it should be said, I went to Church of England schools, I'm not the chief rabbi, but this was originally uh, scheduled for Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath. And one of the interesting things, I mean, that, that's neither here nor there, except that it, it's a wonderful echo of one of the problems in defining Zionism, and that is, if you ask a religious Jew what is Zionism, it is deeply caught up in return to the biblical homeland, as Avi was saying, in Judea and Samaria, equally all the kind of philosophical energy from the beginning of Zionism as a nationalist movement was not religious at all. I mean, Jabotinsky was right-wing. Jabotinsky was not religious. He was a uh, a polymath, uh, brilliant Odessa secular Jew, uh, who, was a, who was a leading Zionist thinker. Um, Herzl was not uh, someone who had a religious upbringing. He was an Austrian journalist who came to Zionism from covering uh, a, a trial in Paris that put him in touch with a sense of European anti-Semitism. And I suppose the central defining, and I, I, I must declare an interest, I declare two interests, and I, then I will wind up. The first interest or background is even though I'm a great admirer of Avi, and I will allow Avi and Asher to debate as one Israeli to an, another the issues of whether uh, Israel is an apartheid state, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you'll have something to say to, on, on that one way or the other. Um, one of the dangers of a broadly Jewish discussion about Zionism um, is that you become very Israelocentric. And one of the things I disagree with Avi on is this notion that even if you accept all of the principles of Avi's argument, and broadly I don't disagree. I think settlements are a huge problem. I think they are a, if not the principal uh, obstacle or were to a peace process, a workable peace process with the Palestinians. Uh, My introduction to the Middle East was not covering Israel. It was covering Lebanon and the Arab world during the late 70s, living in Beirut. Uh, I, uh, for many years, spent a lot more time with Yasser Arafat and George Habash and, the, and his, their aides than any Israeli leaders or ministers. And one of the things that I uh, think is absolutely essential to any kind of objective view of Zionism and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a recognition that it's a tough neighborhood and that even had Israel been saintly, and God knows it hasn't been, um, there is at least uh, equal responsibility, I don't want to use the word blame necessarily, equal responsibility for the periodic breakdown of peace processes on the Arab side as there is on the Israeli side. Now my final comment and my final interest. Uh, My late father-in-law, as it happens, uh, even though I'm not Israeli, uh, my, my wife is, and her late father was actually a member of the Israeli, first Israeli Knesset and was a little bit of a nudnik, as they say in, uh, in Yiddish, a bri- brilliant one. Um, but he had a central kind of 
burning philosophical argument with Zionism. His name was Hillel Cook. He was the, the nephew of uh, the former chief rabbi of Palestine. Um, and he felt very strongly, and I've, I found this moving both intellectually and convincing intellectually, that one of the problems, the key problems with the Zionist project from the start was a failure to define what you meant by a Jewish state. And to define in a Zionist context a sense of Israeli identity that was separate from being a Jew in Israel. And his argument, he, oddly enough, with Jabotinsky's kid in the first Knesset, argued very strongly that one of the early failures of the Israeli state was to write a constitution. I'm almost finished here. Um, and his argument would be, were he alive, and I think it's very relevant to uh, sort of a 60th anniversary discussion of Zionism, um, is that if you don't, f as a founding principle, give a sense of Israeli statehood that embraces uh, both secular Jews or non-Orthodox Jews on the one hand, uh, and non-Jewish residents and citizens of the Israeli state, you in effect either uh, force a kind of religious sense of Jewish identity, which not all Jews accept, not all Israelis accept by any stretch of the imagination, or you force non-Jewish citizens or non-Jewish residents to find another national identity of their own based on not being Jews. And I think in, to a, an alarming degree, that central issue of Zionism re remains 60 years later to be defined. Thank you very much. I'm just going <coughs> to ask a, um, the panelists a couple of questions, and then I'm going to throw it open um, to the audience. And, and first, um, I'd like to ask um, Asha. I mean, you, you, you talked about very eloquently um, about um, what Zionism means and what it is. But but what about this other point that's come up? Is that you know can a people who oppress another um, really be free. And other panelists have said that Zionism failed, you know, quite catastrophically in some ways um, to define itself. So if you could just come back to, on that very, very quickly, please. Well, um, I think I said in my opening remarks that uh, in the, uh, the Israeli anthem and the, the anthem of the Zionism before the State of Israel was created, that we, we uh, hoped, as our anthem says, uh, to be a free people in our own country. And I ended by saying that we probably wouldn't be until the Palestinians are a free people in their own country, too. Uh, and I think that that is true. And I think that the Israeli occupation of 1967 uh, and beyond is one of the great uh, catastrophes uh, of the Zionist enterprise. Uh, and Israel will not be the state that we have always wanted it to be, we, the Jews. If this situation of conflict uh, with the Palestinians continues. But having said that, one has to recognize, and this is the point I think that Ned was making that I want to emphasize and um, put my position very much opposed to that that Avi was making and that Karl was making. Israel is not alone in the Middle East. Israel does not control the Middle East. Israel is not alone in the manner in which the Arab-Israeli conflict has developed over the last century. It takes two to tango. It takes two to make peace. And when there were partners for peace with Israel, Jordan, and Egypt, Israel made peace and gave up the territory. There is a necessity for this debate to overcome what I think has been from the outset its fundamental flaw. The Arabs and the Israelis are equally responsible players. Okay, well, in that case, I'd like to come back to you, um, Abby. You, you, you said that you, you, could, you, could, you could go as far as um, <coughs> agreeing with, with um, Hara Arendt that, that one of the, the problems um, of Israel's development has been this folly of linking its um, destiny to, to that of foreign powers. And I think we, we know who we're talking about. We're talking about the United States um, in the, the recent period. Um, and in some of these discussions that we've been talking about um, 
the Arabs and the Israelis. We haven't talked about the foreign powers and the international solution there. So perhaps you could, you could answer that. Well, how, are you, how is Israel going to step away from this dependency on international powers? And, and as well, what, what's wrong with the idea of a federal state rather than two states when you're talking about these um, territories, particularly in the West Bank? I can answer the question of Israel's relationship with foreign powers by saying that it's always been a cardinal tenet of Zionist foreign policy from the beginning to enlist the support of the preeminent Western power of the era. First it was the Ottoman Empire, then it was Britain, and Israel had an orientation on Britain. And uh, after the decline of Britain, Israel has um, uh, cemented a very close alliance with America. And the special relationship between uh, America and Israel is at its highest and has been under the Bush administration. And the result is that um, never in history has, been, has there been less American restraint on Israel. Israel has been given a completely free hand to do whatever it wants uh, by the Bush administration. But America hasn't been a good friend to Israel. A good friend tells you where you are going wrong. A good friend tells you to stop alienating the entire Arab and Muslim world. A good friend tells you to stop building settlements because it gets in the way of peace. America hasn't done that. So my conclusion is that Israel would have done much, much better from the beginning to try and reach an understanding, a negotiated uh, agreement with its neighbors than it has to rely on an imperial power. In relation to, to some of those points, um, Ned, you, you, you seem to be saying that the real problem of, of, of Zionism is its lack of definition, its failure to come up with the real idea of what a Jewish state was, and the, the kind of um, the, 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 the kind of dead hand of the, the religious um, aspect. Um, but but here here Avi's talking about foreign powers. Isn't that the real problem? Isn't that one of the real problems that Israel has relied too much on defining itself by looking to the big foreign powers to look after it? I, I, I don't think that's a central problem. I think that's a, a, a kind of part of the reality of any kind of foreign policy of a modern state, particularly a modern state that is demographically and otherwise outnumbered in the Middle East. I do absolutely agree with Avi that uh, settlement policy has been a s disaster, a tragedy, uh, a central reason the peace process has gone nowhere. Uh, the only thing I would add is that unlike Avi, I'm not optimistic. Uh, I think the problem that we haven't talked about, and I, uh, the reason I uh, am hesitant to get into this is, again, y you could allow this to spin utterly out of control because I could quite passionately argue um, literally case by case, because I covered this from both sides for a decade and a half, uh, of huge mistakes and missed opportunities by the Israelis, sometimes conscious, sometimes unconscious, even including our, our hero Yitzhak Rabin. One of the main mistakes, in my view, was uh, not recognizing elected mayors on the West Bank in the 1970s, which Rabin could have uh, done with transformative possibilities. But equally, I could give you a half dozen appalling, deliberate or otherwise, er instances in which either Arafat, uh, Syrians, or someone. So, so I, th I think we don't want to spin this out of control. Um, what, what I would say about the kind of um, you, you know, central problem with Zionism uh, isn't whether it's religious or not. I think, I mean, as it happens, I think your point was absolutely right, Carl. I think what has changed now um, is not whether Israel is unilateral, whether it depends on America. It is a superpower in the Middle East. It doesn't need the Americans militarily most of the time. The problem is demography, and that has changed. And I think you're absolutely right that whereas in the early, you know, early decades of, uh, of Zionism, uh, this wasn't as live an issue, you now have a problem which involves settlements as well, where you have an Arab majority uh, in Eretz Israel Shlima, you know, greater Israel. And that, that requires redefinition of what a Jewish state is. Okay, and, and just very briefly, <coughs> Carl, I mean, surely Israel is a tough neighborhood, we've heard, 
um, and Israel's all alone. Surely it, it's not a folly, perhaps, for it to, to look to the Western powers or whatever power there is. Yeah. I just want to clarify this point uh, very quickly as you yeah. keep reminding me. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and defend any of the Arab nations. Let's make this clear <laughs> from the beginning. They've right. screwed the Palestinians more consistently than any other entity in the universe. So I'm not going to stand here and defend their actions. Um, and that's, that's just to, to, to put that straight. What I'm talking about, and it's something you mentioned, uh, Ned, is that there was this failure to define a state, if you like, uh, on certain principles that are clear for all its citizens. First point that I would like to make, this is not something you set up to do on day one and then you keep following for the next hundred years. This is something that states develop throughout their existence and they are born out of political projects. The fact that you chose to close then by talking about the demographic problem reflects exactly this paralysis of political thinking that I'm talking about. And I'm really trying to be really objective over here. And I'm not taking any value judgment in that sense. But it is a striking failure to transform, if you like, that very foundational idea from 60 years ago, which needs to move with the times, needs to change, needs to accept that things change. And, 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 and give it a political content. It can't be fought on a point of principle, if you like, or abstract notions. That needs to make a, a sense to uh, both Jewish and Arab citizens of, of Israel. And that's precisely what I'm talking about. We've got a lot to go on. I want to take um, a first round of interventions um, from the floor. I'll just remind you, 90 seconds, and I'm going to tell you to wind up. We've got a lot to work on. We've got um, Israel's lack of self-definition. Um, are the um, Jews who were once oppressed now an oppressor? We've got the whole um, question of um, um, foreign powers and much, much more. So can you stick your hands up over there? Hi, okay, I've, my first question is to Professor Asher. Um, you said that the Jewish people had managed to get a free state of their own. But surely in Jews, in Israel, in Israel, are there not other people like Arabs? So is it not, do they not have a part in the state as well? And um, to Avi, you say you reject the 67 borders, but why not reject the, um, the earlier expansionist borders? I think 40s something, I'm not sure which, I'm not that good on Jewish history, Israel history even. And um, also, <laughs> you say that they should, um, they should give back the borders, uh, they go back to the 67 borders out of self-interest, but surely, if you're going back to borders, you should do it because you think it's right rather than just out of self-interest. Okay, um, just there, Black Jumper. Can you speak into the microphone, please? Yeah, I'd be very interested in hearing the panel's thoughts on Israel's relationship with Iran. Specifically, what are the problems posed to Zionism by a radical Iranian regime which have rejected the very notion of a sovereign Jewish state and, at least, and on, indeed on at least one occasion called for its outright destruction? Okay, um, guy there in the white shirt. Hi, a uh, point raised by Bruno during the debate was the issue of federali federalization. I was, I was wondering what the panel thought of this fact that the two-state solution, one maybe not the best in the world, does entrench the idea of the Israelis and the Palestinians and only furthers the conflict. Surely something, something like federalization would be the best solution that you could have on offer to bring them together rather than further separate them. Okay, here at the front. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually a question for Carl, and um, you mentioned that the withdrawal from Gaza and the security wall displayed a fear of the Palestinian masses. I wonder to what extent do you think that the uh, elites in Israel today fear their own masses, and are they maybe, through fear of the other, missing uh, the next most damaging thing that could happen to them? Okay. I'm gonna bring some panelists back just very, very quickly. I want si sound bites. I want very, very quick, um, <laughs> snappy uh, responses. So Carl, if you go first, because it was the last question that was addressed to you. Um, yeah, I think there's certainly an element of that, that and that's particularly exhibited in, in you like, uh, if you like, in this element that I talked about of the orchestration if you, in, of the relationship between cultural groups, which is used as a way to preempt a sense of politics from developing in Israel. I mean, we talk about Jewish particularity, but why should Israel be different to any other country in the world in which politics could be fought along 
class lines or, or, or out of self-interest or any of these notions. This idea that you are mythologically bound by your uh, history uh, is just completely crippling to any sense of healthy politics in, in the whole region, not necessarily in Israel itself. And this is what I find really unappealing uh, to, de to deal with. Do you think they know their own people? Well, it, it's so strange to talk about this. Consider that in the last 10 years alone, there's been 1 million new, new immigrants that came to Israel. The population swelled by 20%. Obviously, what the elites have done is they've outsourced the way to, to deal with these uh, new immigrants. The same like it happened with the Arab immigrants. There was never consciously any kind of attempt to engage with the masses in a, in a more political framework. It has been outsourced, and purely out of this uh, lust for the demographic superiority, which is, which is is not what politics is about. Actually, we'll come back on the, the, the question of, of Arabs in Israel. Um, yes. Um, when the State of Israel was established, uh, it issued a Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence, if you uh, have a look at the text, uh, was made on the day that Israel was founded, calls upon the Arabs in the country to participate in the state as free and equal citizens despite the fact that the war with the Arab neighborhood was already in full swing. Uh, so the idea that Israel is a state that has a, a Jewish majority and defines itself as the state of the Jewish people essentially means that the Arab minority cannot enjoy full equality with the majority is, I think, uh, a misnomer. There are many uh, national states throughout Europe that have national minorities. What Israel should do and I think uh, this is time for Israel seriously to think about this, is to recognize the Palestinians in Israel, the citizens of Israel who are Palestinians, as a national minority, and to take the European Union constitution on minority rights in the EU as the guideline for Israeli relations between majority and minority in the state of Israel. One point I must add about the security wall. You speak about the security wall as if 1,100 Israelis were not shredded in the buses and the restaurants by suicide bombers. The wall was not built because of demography. The wall was built because Israelis were being slaughtered on a daily basis by suicide bombers who used to take a cab into Israel, blast the Israelis in a cinema, and that was it. Since the wall has been established, the suicide bombings are over. So I suggest you see that in its real context and not in the one that has been uh, fabricated here. And just, just very quickly, Ali, because it, it's come up again, um, uh, and here in relation to kind of European-style solutions to national minorities, and sometimes where you do have two peoples living together in many European countries in one federal state. So rather than having two states, wouldn't it be better to have one federal state that could bring together um, Israel and Palestine. I, I think that's a very noble um, <laughs> vision, <laughs> federation, um, and I wish it were possible, um, but I don't think it's a realistic uh, plan to go forward because it wouldn't be acceptable to virtually all Israelis, whatever the political color. Uh, I agree with virtually everything that Asher said up to 1967. Our disagreements start later <laughs> uh, because um, the Jews are a people like any other and are entitled to independence and self-determination. Isaiah Berlin, the Jewish philosopher, used to say, the Jews are like any other people, only more so. <laughs> um, so there is Jewish nationalism and there is Arab nationalism and a precondition for a federation is that first the uh, Palestinians must have complete independence and hoist the Palestinian flag. <coughs> After that, on day two, they can start negotiating about a federation. Okay. And then I do want to ask you to come back on the Iran issue because you were talking about the, the religious aspect of, of Zionism. Here, here you have a kind of counter nationalism to Zionism. Um, Iran that's also takes a religious, quite a religious form. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 the, the Iran issue is on the one hand very complex, on the uh, other hand quite simple. The simple aspect is, uh, and this is one of the Bush administration's error, um, is that to the extent there is 
a major security threat in the Middle East, potentially, uh, it is much more likely to be Iran than Iraq. Uh, and um, the notion of the Iranian regime getting a nuclear weapon uh, uh, or uh, the quite frankly laughable notion that it, it is seeking nuclear power uh, uh, for basically, um, you know, as to complement its wind turbines and, uh, and ethanol program and uh, rather than with hostile intent uh, is quite frightening and not just to Israel I, I should say but and not just even to the kind of you know neocons in Washington but to anybody in Europe who looks at the map so that's the easy part the difficult part which is the broader issue of religious fundamentalism um, leads me to make the following sound bite which, which, uh, which has to do with a lot of these issues and that is one of the areas of Zionism that we're missing is that generationally we've moved on and the reason I'm so pessimistic is that despite the fact that this all merit thing that Avi's talking about, about one for one you know, trade of, of territory giving up essentially all, all the settlements that's not all merit, that's common sense. Since uh, Camp David and before, everybody knows what the solution to this situation is. To, to the paragraph, to the, to the you know, crossed T and dotted I. Um, the problem is political process and political leaders. And I think both on the, the Israeli side and on the Arab side, there simply is such a dearth of political vision, political leadership, and political process that it is issues like uh, fundamentalist Islam on the one hand, uh, basically uh, bartering for uh, you know, support for religious schools as part of co coalition, co coalition deals on the Israeli side. Those issues rather than political leadership and political vision are likely to define both Israel and its Arab neighbors and it's hard to see how you get a peace solution out of that. Thank you. Out to the audience again. I've got um, James. If you could go to the back there, yes, please. Uh, could I quickly? Oh, sorry. Quickly ask um, on what you've just said. Is it really just the settlements? Say, for some amazing reason, Israel said, "Right, we are withdrawing from all the settlements." Would that really be it, or would there then be? the Jerusalem sharing and the right of return raised as something, again, to continue for goodness knows how long. Okay. In, in the red shirt here at the front, please. Shall I go? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm always interested in these uh, fora where we have lots of learned criticism, what uh, people would do if they were, in fact, the supreme commander of Israel. That's an image to conjure with. Um, so, Daniel. Uh, yeah, my brief take on it is uh, what you speak into the mic. Yeah. Wrong, way Wrong way around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my take on it is that what should be clear after 60 years is that the Zionist dream does not work, cannot work, will never work. And to understand that, you really have to start by looking not at the Palestinian question and the settlements, but at the Jewish question. I mean, Ned Temko mentioned quite correctly uh, the Dreyfus trial, where Theodor Herzl, the founder of modern political Zionism, saw this French army officer uh, being charged with treason, uh, and Herzl, who until then was an assimilationist, suddenly realized, he said, oh my God, you know, there's no way that we can fight anti-Semitism. This French army officer is accused of being a traitor. Uh, what we need to do is to set up our own colonial enclave in the Middle East, because that way the Jewish people can be free, they can look after themselves, they won't be prey to external forces. And of course that view became the mainstream view among the Jewish people because of the Holocaust. The Holocaust was a victory of anti-Semitism, and so not surprisingly, most Jewish people took up Zionism after the Second World War because of the victory of the Holocaust. The thing is though, it doesn't work. You know, Israel has not brought the Jewish people 60 years of peace. You know, all, st all strands of Zionism are united by that belief that somehow uh, Zionism will bring them fr freedom and autonomy. But it just doesn't work. Not when you're living in a hostile neighborhood, as other, other people have put it. Not when you're dependent on the Western powers for patronage, as has been discussed. You cannot have 
that kind of freedom. What you're, in that situation, you're completely prey to not only hostility from the indigenous population, but if the Western power decides to dump you, which America may very well do, is already doing in relation to Israel, you're in trouble. So just to conclude, my, con my conclusion would be uh, not to say, not to focus on Israel, but to say we've got to campaign against Western intervention in the Middle East and against racial discrimination. That's the conclusion I would draw. Okay, red shirt there and then Natalie. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea that uh, Israel doesn't really need the US. And I think it's the second biggest recipient of funding from uh, the United States Agency for International Development gets more money than the whole of Africa put together. So if it doesn't need this money, why is it being given and what's it being used for? Uh, and secondly, um, in terms of the equality of the uh, blame for the Israelis and the Arabs, surely in the United Nations, nearly all the time there's a resolution, it's blocked sort of about 160 to four, the four always being the United States, Israel, sort of like the Marshall Islands and Uzbekistan or something. So surely it's pretty much um, more on the onus on the Israeli side. Natalie? Okay, um, I was wondering if in some respects we could um, bring the discussion a bit more up to date about what Israel is about today rather than its mistakes of the past and the peace process and how to uh, resolve it. Um, so uh, particularly uh, Professor Susser, as a person living in, in Israel at the moment, I was wondering if you could perhaps address the point that Carl uh, was alluding to in terms of the sort of overarching loss of uh, confidence or loss of an overarching ideology on behalf of the political elite in Israel and how that impacts on Israeli people's attitudes and commitment to, to the Zionist project. Because it seems to me that today a lot of kind of cornerstone uh, institutions of Zionism are, um, if not in decline, then at least uh, they've, they're suffering from a lack of prestige and a lack of commitment, particularly uh, the army, the, the IDF. Um, which is falling, the conscription rate is falling and it doesn't have the same prestige as it did in the past. But also other um, movements and institutions like the kibbutz movement, even the um, Aliyah uh, movement, the reasons and character of the people coming to Israel at the moment are not the same as they were in the past. So I was wondering if I could have your comments on that. Right, I'm going to take a couple of comments um, for panel. That was Natalie who actually organised um, this whole debate. So a little round of applause. <coughs> so, Asha, could you, could, you, could you come back on, 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 on those um, points, some of those points that she's, she's asked? And again, um, very, very quickly, and, and sound bites, please. Well, I, I could uh, give you a few sound bites on some of the other questions also, but I will just uh, restrain myself and uh, relate to this one. Um, I think it's a gross exaggeration to say that there's a, a loss of uh, you know, overarching ideology and when you compare the immigrants who come to Israel today with the immigrants who came in the past, you, know, you would think that all the immigrants who fled from Germany and Poland in the 1930s were all driven by Zionist ideology. They weren't. They were not driven by Zionist ideology. They were driven by the fear of death. Uh, and most of the immigrants, including those who came from the Soviet Union uh, a decade or so ago, the great majority of the immigrants to Israel uh, didn't come for uh, reasons of ideological conviction, but came uh, for, uh, because of persecution from where they came from and for lack of a better choice. Uh, the real ideologues of the Zionist movement are a core minority elite, as it is in most revolutionary movements. Uh, but that is exactly the reason why Israel should be. There are Jews from France coming to Israel now in large numbers. If you go to any place in Tel Aviv or Netanya, you'll hear a lot of French spoken. The reason is that these Jews of France fear for their well-being in France of today. That they have Israel to go to automatically is our raison d'etre. That is why we are there. They are not great ideologues. Uh, and this is the, the fundamental uh, still at the beginning of the 21st uh, century, a need for uh, the Israeli state. Uh, reduced uh, rates of um, a conscription to the IDF has very little to do with ideology in the strict sense of the word. It has to do with religious politics. It has to do with the rise of, uh, um, I would say, Jewish orthodoxy among certain segments of the Israeli population. And orthodox men uh, enjoy 
uh, exemption from uh, conscription. That is the main reason why the numbers are going down, not because of ideological conviction. In terms of the way the IDF is managed with the people who do join the IDF, for its core elite units to which people have to volunteer, it has 10 times more volunteers than it needs. If that's for pilot school or for the commandos or forever you want to say. So I don't think the point you're making is as valid as uh, you seem to think it is. The kibbutz is out of date. The kibbutz is out of date like many other elements of historical socialism that have become out of date in very many places. In some places they have become too out of date as we've just seen in the United States and elsewhere. Perhaps some rethinking should be done about that. But the kibbutz movement is out of date in terms of what the state of Israel really requires. And therefore, it is um, not such an issue of ideological retreat, but rather a simple, uh, pragmatic calculus made by uh, the leaders of the state. About the vision of the leadership, I don't think the leadership, uh, much of it, lacks the vision. It's not the vision that they lack, it's the guts. The goal to take the great historical decisions that we all know have to be made. It's not the vision they lack, but guts. Carl, can you have, can you, what's the point of having, what's the point of having guts if, if you don't have vision? The Is that a, or, or the other way around? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you become again that Rambo figure that uh, 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 I've talked about. Uh, but I find it really strange that I'm here coming, I followed your command, I want to be really objective, I want to discuss Israel at 60, and all my fellow panelists <laughs> want to talk about peace. <laughs> peace is going to take a long time. Yeah. We come out of historic struggles, a struggle of Palestinian people for self-determination, the struggle of the Jewish people for doing the same. We're not here to talk about that. And I find it quite symptomatic of the problems that I highlighted in my introduction, that you constantly evade the, the points about Israel at 60. And I think, Asha, uh, uh, your, your latest uh, uh, points over there were just uh, classic in evasion kind of and refusing to realize that Zionism is at a law at a, as a political project. Let's take the point about immigration. When you say that these people that come to Israel, they don't come out of ideological kind of drive in the past or now, and they're coming basically because of security. When people flee somewhere for security, they would go to a safe place. They wouldn't go to the most troubled place in the world, right? <laughs> so. They are willing to go to that place despite the fact, as you said, that thousands of them were being slaughtered, and that's why the security wall was needed, because there's something that they believe in, and there's an idea that draws them. So to actually spin it and say that it's purely a security concern, I don't think that's true. However, there is the failure that you refuse to acknowledge among the leadership to kind of ex rise to the occasion, if you like, or the level of expectations of, the, uh, of, of these immigrants on a, on a political level. Uh, Abby, <coughs> Carl, say, Carl is pointing to a lack of, of leadership. Um, do you agree? Uh, you can't help uh, but agree that there is lack of leadership, lack of... Uh, courage, and the tragedy is that, as um, Ned pointed out, we all know what the solution is. The solution has been clear for some time, and the blueprint for a settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are the Clinton parameters of December 2000, which said there would be an independent Palestinian state alongside Israel, uh, with a capital city in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem, oh, stretching over the whole of the Gaza Strip and 94 to 96% of the West Bank. That's the only solution. It involves the partition of Palestine and compensation, not the right of return of the 1948 refugees. That's the only solution that there is. And Olmert now accepts that. So if Israel is going to keep 5% of the West Bank, it would have to compensate the Palestinians with 5% of its own territory in the Negev, south of Gaza, uh, perhaps. But the Israeli leaders don't have the courage to say this, and uh, it's per perhaps not an accident that Olmert only had the courage to say that <laughs> after he had resigned. 
Ned, you, you, you've expressed a couple of times your, your pessimism. Um, where does your pessimism stand in, in relation to this question of kind of guts um, and leadership? Um, I'm, I'm still deeply pessimistic. My, the one ray of hope, oddly enough, and I, I, I will do Carl a favor, I'll bring it back to Zionism again. Um, the potential next prime minister of Israel is a woman named Sipi Livni. Um, and she's an interesting generational case study in Zionism. Her dad was a guy named Eitan Livni, who was the chief of staff of the Irgun, uh, the, the anti-British uh, underground. Um, despite what's said in the media, he, he was out of commission by the time of the King David Hotel explosion. He was, uh, I think, in, he was in, imprisoned by the British in Acre by that time. But be that as it may, um, Tippi Livni is an interesting case in point because she, on the one hand, uh, from her family breakfast table on, has imbibed not only Zionism but revisionist Zionism, Jabotinskyite Zionism, but is a very smart lawyer um, who came to the conclusion that a kind of relevant 21st century definition of Zionism entails giving up most of the land of the West Bank, all of Gaza and most of the West Bank. She gets it, and she gets it to come back to uh, Avi's uh, soundbite which, with which I absolutely agree, and that it is, it is patently in Israel's own interest to get rid of most of the West Bank, to give it back to a nation Palestinian state. And I take issue with one of the questioners who said, uh, is it a bad thing to do that out of self-interest? I got news for you, politics is self-interest. And people do things, nation states do things, not only because it's good, in fact too rarely because it's good or moral, but because it makes sense as part of a, a, of a, def, a kind of national self-interest, and this does. The final comment I would make is that I would be very optimistic if this depended only on Sippy Livni, because I think she might have potentially guts, which Ehud Olmert patently didn't have. And, uh, and even Sharon didn't have. Uh, Sharon, I th we never know, but I, uh, my suspicion is Sharon probably wouldn't have. Uh, Sippy Livni's got potential in that regard. The problem, anyone who has studied the history of the Middle East conflict, the real tragedy is that it does take two to tango. And when one side has guts or vision, as occasionally they do, it is uncanny how often the other side screws it up. And uh, I am not confident that given the huge divisions within Palestinian society, uh, the, the battle, the political battle between uh, Hamas and Fatah, uh, just to name one example, uh, the, the, the degree to which Israel is responsible for having weakened Abu Mazen and Fatah over a period of years, uh, whether the two that need to tango will get guts at the same time. And that is the root of my pessimism. Uh, but can I just make one final thing, uh, a repost to Carl? Uh, can you, can uh, you save uh, it for something up? Because I, I want to take get one more round of questions in and then... Okay, but you can, uh, but th this really is a response to Carl. C Carl, I understand your frustration about Jews and Israelis, in the case of the two other panelists, incessantly talking about Israel-Palestine when it comes to Zionism. I don't think that's, uh, I, I think that's inter an interesting comment on Zionism. I, th I think there is a consensus within Zionism now, and I think this is one of the encouraging things, is that despite the many successes of the State of Israel, I think Asher put it very well, that part of the Zionist project, the success of the Zionist project, is sorting out some sense of peaceful so coexistence with this state's immediate neighbors. Right, can I see people who want to ask questions I can start? <coughs> Planning out. Can we, we have two microphones? We've got one here. Can you go take the woman just here in the middle? James, if you could kind of go around over there and take the woman who's wearing a scarf at the back. What's your mobile? Is it mine? Okay. Um, it's, you seem to have um, highlighted only the conflict in, in Israel. <laughs> Israel 
and conflict. I'd like uh, Professor Sasser to talk about Israel, the country, and to hear about um, some of its in, uh, fantastic achievements. Um, if we can hear more about that to understand the country and its people, and rather than just the conflict. Israel is not only conflict. OK. And then at the back there, please. Um, I have a comment and a question. Sorry, is this working? It is. Yeah, OK. Um, I'd just like to um, introduce a personal story. Um, my grandfather uh, was forced out of the, what was then the coastal Palestinian town of Acre in 1948. Uh, he had to leave his house and his orange groves for nearby Syria, which he hoped would be a temporary measure. Um, he passed away last year, having never gone back. Um, a parallel story, um, a close British Jewish friend of mine two months ago made Aliyah or emigrated to um, Israel um, and she's been keeping me updated about you know her settling in and and how the Israeli state bankrolls the new immigrants and and you know her her motivation to try and work for Israeli Palestinian reconciliation which is why she actually moved out there in the first place she's hoping to to work on um, Jewish Palestinian reconciliation um, I'd like to ask the panel um, in the light of um, truth and reconciliation initiatives in other parts of the world, um, such as South Africa and other, and other parts of the world which have been um, blighted by ethnic conflict, one of the first stages of um, promoting reconciliation has been acknowledging the pain and injustice of the other, which in this context neither side have done. Um, the Palestinians do not understand European history and Zionism is an ideology which gains strength from the embers of, of European anti-Semitism. And also, Jewish Israelis do not understand the pain of the Palestinians. So I'd just like to put that to the Thanks. panel. Thanks. Could you give a microphone to the, m the man in front in a white shirt? Thank you very much. This is a question uh, for um, two of the panelists who said that um, everybody knows what the, you know, what, 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 what the solution has to be. Um, as I see it, everybody doesn't know, and the main people who don't seem to know are Likud and the people to the right of that in Israel. Uh, and even within the last couple of weeks, um, um, in fact, Netanyahu has said the Palestinians don't have to have a state. We can keep the settlements. Now, there is a real current in Israel, and it's in the mainstream political party, which doesn't seem to know. And isn't this one of the big, big problems? Um, over there, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what the panel think about um, whether the situation in Israel with the conflict and with the threat, but also with um, like some undeniable uh, abuse of human rights, uh, what effect the situation has on strengthening or weakening Judaism and Zionism worldwide? Okay, we've got a guy over here in a green shirt. Is there anyone else who, who wants to make a point or ask a question? Put your hand up now or don't, basically. <laughs> okay. Okay, I would like to make two points. One of them is, I think in the Middle East, the secularism and democracy are in crisis. Let's not forget that establishing a state on, the, on a religious ground is, is dangerous. And let's not forget that Judaism is a religion. It is not a politics. It's not a, a nation. Why become a nation? So we have got the examples, the experiment of establishing a state on religious basis, such as Taliban and Iranian regime, they are dangerous. So this kind of vision for establishing a state on a religious basis is dangerous. And the, the, the Israel always claims that it is dem secularism and democracy. I think this, it is completely in contradiction with uh, secularism and democracy. The second point is in, in regarding making a peace in, in the Middle East. I completely understand the winning of Hamas in Palestine is a democratic deficit and it is dangerous for the, for the whole of Middle East. But on another hand, the Western powers and the Israel are making a huge mistake, which is they are not making negotiation with their enemies. I think the point of making peace and negotiation is with your enemies, not with your friends. I think as, uh, Tony Blair is uh, making a, 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 whole, a, a major mistake, which is uh, as a Middle East uh, uh, peace con info in the Middle East, is not willing to have a coffee with Hamas leaders, at least uh, as a coffee and a lunch. So, <laughs> so just, just, to, just to make a point that why Hamas 
is not willing to recognize Israel. It's not, not one giving them an opportunity to explain this point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.